qualified Olympic athlete, groundbreaking mathematician, codebreaker in World War II, and a homosexual. Today's video is about Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a groundbreaking mathematician who helped the British during World War II to break the German Enigma code. Exceptionally gifted, this man created the basic for computers and computer science as we know it. But he never really received the credit he deserved. Why? Because he was gay, of course. Why else? Hello everybody, my name is Jade and I'm glad to see you here for Queer History Part 2. In this video, there are a few things I'm going to talk about. The early life of Alan Turing, his time at school and university, his time during World War II, and what happened after World War II and being persecuted for being a homosexual. Early life. It's the 23rd of June, 1912. Maida Ville, London. Alan Turing is born. When Alan Turing turned six, he was enrolled at St. Michael's. Here, the headmistress and his teachers quickly picked up on his talents. After his time at St. Michael's, he spent some time at the Hazelhurst Preparatory School. After that, he moved on to the Sherborne Boarding School when he was 13. When he was 13, he had developed an inclination towards math and science. This, however, did not earn the respect of his teachers, who considered the classics to be more important to education than science. At one point, the headmaster wrote a note to his parents, saying the following. I hope he will not fall between two stools. If he is to stay at public school, he must aim at becoming educated. If he is to be solely a scientific specialist, he is wasting his time at a public school. This note suggested that becoming a scientific specialist wasn't the same as being educated. Christopher Morcom. While at Sherborne, Alan formed a friendship with Christopher Morcom, who in his eyes was his first true love. Sadly, this love was not meant to be, as it was the 1920s. Christopher Morcom died in 1930 with untreated tuberculosis. This event, understandably, caused a lot of grief and sorrow in Alan Turing, who as a true Brit dealt with it in the most British way I can think of, by working harder on the topics of science and math. I mean, yeah, sure, you, you lose somebody you love, what do you do? Work even harder, that's a healthy way of coping with things. But I guess things were different back then and that was the only healthy way men could show their emotions by working even harder and not talking about it. Sad. Mathematics and science were a passion he had shared with Christopher Morcom. So in a way, it also makes sense for him to dive deeper into that. After the death of Christopher, Alan kept writing letters with the mother of Christopher. These personal letters give us a unique insight in his feelings for Christopher. I am sure I could not have found anywhere another companion so brilliant and yet so charming and unconceited. The relation that Alan and Christopher had is one that would in internet culture quickly get the label and they were roommates. But I don't know about you guys, but I never found myself expressing that way over just a roommate. There was more going on there. After Christopher died, he never really had a connection like that again. University. Alan Turing studied at King's College Cambridge from 1931 to 1934. Here he was awarded first class honors in mathematics in 1934 upon his graduation. In 1935, he was elected a fellow at King's College because of the quality of his dissertation. In 1936, Alan published a paper. And I'm gonna have to read this from the script because I can't remember this, so excuse me. On computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem. That's quite a mouthful. But it's this paper that formed the basics of the universal computing machine, the precursor to what we nowadays call the computer. This machine could compute anything that would be computable. To some of you, that might sound like mumbo jumbo, but from what I understand, it means that that was a machine that can compute anything that adheres to computable rules, which is insane because before that, people would have to do it by hand. There was a job description for it and it was called a computer. Somebody who computes. In a sense, you could say that indirectly due to Alan Turing, people might have lost their jobs. In 1938, he earned his PhD from Princeton University in the United States of America, New Jersey. Of course, the PhD was in mathematics, because as time moved on, people were starting to see what a genius Alan was with mathematics. Him earning this PhD cemented his role as one of the top researchers in the fields of computing, 
and mathematics. It was during his time at Princeton that he also picked up an interest and did some courses on cryptology. For those of you who don't know what cryptology is, cryptology is all about how do you encrypt messages and how do you decrypt messages. During his time at Princeton, he got offered a postdoctoral research assistant position, but he turned it down and went back to the United Kingdom. His role in World War II and Bletchley Park. During Anna's lifetime, there was a storm brewing. Over on the mainland in Europe, Nazi Germany was slowly consolidating power, grabbing power. And that's just disgusting! Britain was about to go to war against Nazi Germany. A day before the war broke out, Allen was summoned to Bletchley Park. Why? Well, the Germans were well versed in the art of cryptology. They had a cipher that was almost unbreakable for the British. So they were seeking for their top minds to help them out. One of those top minds was Alan Turing, who had a focus on mathematics, computing, and cryptology. He seemed a perfect fit for the position. So at the headquarters of the British Codebreaking Institute at Bletchley Park, Turing and his colleagues got to work and breaking the so-called German Enigma code. The Enigma code was so hard to crack because the rules for deciphering it were constantly changing. You can imagine it a little bit like this. You're a hacker. You want to know somebody's password. So you start trying to crack the password. You have the first two letters of the password cracked. And suddenly, when the person logs in, it changes. It's a new password. You have to start all over again. So you can't crack the password because the password never changes. You need to find out the rhythm and the algorithm behind the password. And that's what's difficult. And it's also frustrating because every time you're making progress to just the password, it gets nullified again when the person logs in. It's irritating, it's frustrating, and that's why the British had such a hard time with it. Because yes, you maybe could crack one password, but the next time the person logs in, it's gone. There's a new one and you have to start all over again. Turing figured out that there must be a key in every single message. A key that recognized, I'll use these sequence to read the message because the system needs to recognize how to decipher the code. At that point, Turing started working on what's called bombs. And no, these are not the explosive kinds. These bombs were basically databases of most frequently used words in the messages, making them possible keys to deciphering the Enigma code. When a message was received, the database would cycle through all the possible keys that was in the bomb and try to decipher the code. At first, this took half a day and there was a point where it almost went instant. So there was a lot of progress made. It was hard, it was tense work and it was frustrating because at first it was mostly guesswork. But thanks to Alan's knowledge of cryptology, computing and mathematics, they managed to do it. They managed to crack the Enigma code. On July 9th, 1941, their team did it. They cracked it and they could read the message. This breakthrough played a huge role in the Allies winning the Second World War because the German communication no longer was a secret. During his time at Bletchley Park, Alan made no secret about his homosexuality and neither did his employers. It was known, but they figured your mind is more valuable than your sexuality to us. At one point, Alan even proposed to a fellow female researcher only to blow it off by saying, I can't do this, I am gay. He openly came out for it, he admitted it. It was no secret after the war. Most of Alan's contributions to the war were kept secret by the government for state security. To make matters even worse, he was dishonorably discharged from the British intelligence service. Why? Well, the reason was simple according to them. It was against their customs for a homosexual to be part of their group. What? It was against their customs for homosexuals to be part of their group? This man, he helps you break the German secret code. And as soon as the war is over, you do what? You throw him out to the street? That's just disgusting. After that, he worked until 1948 at the National Physics Lab. He stopped there, and after that we don't really have a lot about his track record in jobs. In 1952, he qualified for the Olympic Marathon. However, in the same year, from 1952, tragedy struck. His home was burgled, the thing of great value was stolen, everything was replaceable. But then it took an emotional turn. 19-year-old Arnold Murray knew who the burglar was. Why is that interesting? 
because Arnold Murray and Alan Turing had been seeing each other for a few weeks when the burglary happened. Murray was emotional and in this state, he threatened to reveal to the police that Alan was gay, which was still a criminal offense at the time. 1952, Britain. Alan refused to be bullied into silence and went to the police. When the police asked how he knew who the burglar was, Alan admitted he was in a relation with Arnold Murray who knew the burglar. All of a sudden, Alan was on trial for gross indecency. He was turned into the perpetrator while he was the victim of a burglary. He was turned into a perpetrator instead of a victim because of his sexual attraction? On advice of his solicitor, he pled guilty to the charge of gross indecency. He got a choice, go to prison or be chemically castrated. Chemically castrated because of how you were born. And yeah. he picked chemical castration because that seemed to be more enjoyable than life in prison where he as a homosexual probably wouldn't survive long. Chemical castration at the time was taking a year of estrogen. Something some people would probably die for to get the state to give them a year free of estrogen, but different video, different topic. In 1945, a year after his treatment, he was found dead in his apartment, holding an apple with traces of cyanide. A genius mind simply fading out of existence. No goodbye letter, nothing. The law that Turing was evicted under wasn't revoked for another 40 years. In 1949, in the year that I was born, it was still considered gross indecency to be gay in Britain. Britain, do better. In September of 2009, Prime Minister Gordon Brown apologized for Turing's treatment, but he didn't offer a full pardon, meaning that Olympic runner, warrior, and genius mathematician Alan Turing, till this day, is still a felon in Britain. For what? For being gay? Come on, Britain, do better. A month ago now, a new 50 pound note started circulating in Britain. Alan Turing's face is on this 50 pound note. Giving this unhumanely treated war hero some respect for the things that he did, but somehow a full pardon still isn't there. In, in the story of Alan Turing, we see how cruel governments can be to people they consider second class citizens. Using Alan for his genius mind when they needed it, but kicking him out on the curb as soon as it didn't fit anymore. Disgusting. We see a brilliant mind who wasn't fearful of his feeling and who didn't go to great lengths to hide what he felt and how he felt. Living in a time rife with homophobia, he showed the world that being gay isn't the only thing there is to a gay person. He did this with his war contributions, his contributions to mathematics, to science, to computing, to cryptology. Alan Turing was an inspiration, to say the least. I thought the story needed to get out there. We need to show people that gay people, queer people, we are everywhere, we are in every field. It isn't just being queer, isn't just one part of our personality. We can do great things. Look at Alan, he was a qualified marathon runner. He was somebody who did great things for the field of mathematics and computing. Thank you for watching. If you aren't subscribed, subscribe. It really helps. Thank you very much. My name was Jade. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.